I lived in China uh, 18, 19 years ago uh, for a couple of years. And I was always predicting back then that, hey, once these Chinese companies figure out how to do branding, they're going to take mm. over the world. Yes. Because they make, the, they make the product and then I slap my brand on the thing and mark it up 5X and I get all the if margin. If they can learn UX, UI design. I always said this about Israeli and they're companies. they're starting to do it. You know, that's they're what these companies are. Yes. That's would, what's happening right now. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Miro helps take ideas from in your head to out there in the world with its ability to democratize collaboration and input. Sign up for free at Miro.com slash startups. Curotech, are you one of those companies that knows you need to be using AI, but you're not even sure where to start? Well, then you need Curotech. They are AI experts and they're offering Twist listeners an AI strategy roadmap tailored to your business for $5,000. That's 50% off the normal cost just for telling them we sent you. Check out Curotech.com slash twist and get $5,000 off. And Ketone IQ is a clean energy boost without sugar or caffeine. Get 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash twist. All right, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. Fan favorite is back on the program. Ryan Peterson is the CEO and co-founder of Flexport. Back on the show for the second time. You've seen him on the All In podcast two or three times. He speaks at uh, the All In Summit. He was last on this podcast, This Week in Startups, on episode 1169 back in February of 2021. That was peak pandemic days, and that was 700 episodes, if you can imagine. Lots happened since then. He stepped down as CEO and became the executive chair in March of last year. We'll get into that. Then in July, he announced he was going to be a partner at Founders Fund. And then in September, he retook the reins as CEO, apparently to get costs and things under control. And we're going to get into everything and more today. Welcome back to the program, Ryan Peterson. Thanks for having me back. What, what, wow, it's been, did you say it's been 700 episodes since 700 I came back? 700 episodes. Can't be right. You know, it is. You're you know hard. what happened was, yeah, you know, I always wanted to try being like Howard Stern uh, and have my own daily show. And, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, the podcast gets popular, the ads sell out. And I just told the ad sales team, well, if you sell out all the ads for three months, I'll add a day. And it went from two day, one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, five days a week, then six days a week. And then I realized that we did all in and it was seven days a week. And I realized, you know what? Be careful what you wish for in life. My entire life became doing podcasts and it was exhausting. And so now I'm back down to four days a week for this week in startups, one all in five a week, five days, one hour a day. And, you know, I do this instead of having lunch and getting fat, right? It's like a better deal. Uh, other people go have lunch and I just do a podcast. So um, just to remind everybody, what does um, Flexport do? What is the business of Flexport? How do you make money? Who are your customers? Uh, well, Flexport's a global logistics company. And we, we use technology to make that easier, better, cheaper for companies to ship cargo anywhere in the world from wherever it's made, deliver to the end customer in over 100 countries. And that you know, what that looks like is we actually, our technology lets you place orders to your factories. Uh, factories acknowledge those orders. They become users too. That's one of the coolest parts about Flexport is that every time we get in a, a U.S. company, that's where we started, but we're now all over the world. But if we get a U.S. company, on average, we'll get 18 of their factories to become users too. Uh, and so they're receiving orders through the system and then placing bookings to get the cargo picked up and shipped, whether it's by air or ocean, uh, including some cross-border trucking across Canada and Mexico. Uh, and then delivery. And then um, last year, we bought Shopify Logistics. And that's the last mile arm. So now we have fulfillment centers doing e-commerce pick and pack, uh, delivering both to retail stores and to customers' houses all over the United States. This is something I wanted you to explain to me. Um, so in, in a way, are you software and a marketplace? So the software is what people pay you for, but then there's a marketplace to get those logistics and the deliveries going we're, is we're really that closer to like a logistics service provider from a business model standpoint and the way customers think about us is like you're paying us to move cargo around the world to ship your packages we use technology to make ourselves much more efficient and reliable lowering the cost for the customer and then giving them much better user experiences to do things like planning how much inventory to have uh getting that the data needs to flow in parallel at the end of the day supply chains are about the flow of goods 
the flow of data, and then the flow of dollars. And we now have offerings for all of those things, uh, including financing products to help you buy inventory, compliance products. That's part of the data is like clearing customs, getting things delivered. So it's really a managed service is closer to that. There are marketplace like dynamics in that we work with on the asset owning side. We have 400,000 trucks in our mobile apps. Uh, we've got all contracts with all the ocean carriers and airlines, warehouses, cus- other customs brokers. Like these are kind of supply side vendors. Um, but the customer doesn't really think about that as a marketplace. They buy from Flexport and it's on us to get the right providers and lined up. Got it. So I wanted to ask you about this. I think you called it pack and ship from China pick and, to pick America. And pack. Oh, uh, from China to the US. Yes because there are a series of new websites that have gotten very popular. Some people are not aware of them. Other people are obsessed with them. I mm. think Timu, uh, T-E-M-U, AliExpress, which is part of Alibaba, uh, Sheen, which is clothing, S-H-E-I-N. You see these as some of the top apps in the app store. And you wonder, like, who's using these? It turns out it's very popular amongst kids who are on a budget. Uh, and I just did this myself as a test. And I think uh, TikTok now has the ability to, they have TikTok shopping. And so uh, I was looking at Laura Piana shoes because Chamath is into these shoes and Laura Piana sent the besties some shoes at the All In Summit. And they gave people in the VIP bags like a, something from Laura Piana. And I saw people um, promoting knockoffs of these like three or $4,000 shoes. So as a goof, I bought the $20 versions of them. I kid you not, they came two days ago in a plastic bag. It's the worst quality I've ever seen on a pair of shoes. <laughs> uh, like, and they smell terrible. Like they, they smell like they're painted. Was with it like, 20 bucks? 20 bucks? It, it, I think it was 25 bucks for what were Laura Piana ripoffs of their like $1,200 loafers. And you know, if you put them next to each other, you would obviously know the difference. Maybe if you didn't put them next to the other, it wouldn't look so bad. But what is this new phenomenon of people selling knockoff products or pick? Is that pick and pack? Uh, and well, things going um, directly we, from China to US customers? Yeah. So the industry term for this is actually called a Section 321 clearance. And that's a section of the US customs regulations, uh, which allows you to not pay customs duties. Mm. If, you, if the goods are worth less than $800, Got it. then you don't pay customs duties. And now the trick to doing this is that each individual product has to be already consigned to you, the end consumer, to buy it. Mm. Um, And so that means you've got to be able to be efficient and like you're fulfilling that unit from China or it could be from Mexico. A lot of people are doing this in Mexico and Canada now. Uh, But you're crossing the border one item at a time. Now, they'll bundle lots of these into a freight shipment. So you still get the low cost of freight. Uh, mm. But you're clearing those goods and avoiding customs duties. So with the cu- with the Trump tariffs, you know, which Biden has continued, uh, I think we got to now call them the Biden tariffs or just the, t- the new tariff yeah. regime that we have. Um, that 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 can be really significant, you know, 20, 25 mm. percent savings on that by. Um, but uh, and so that's that's what's happening there is fundamentally is like avoiding customs duties. It's huge right now. Um, in Q4, it was about 50 percent of all the air freight flying across the pacific was wow. e-commerce parcels generally broadly e-commerce across all these- parcels so what's happening logistically is somebody in the united states orders one of these products you know uh, listen I'll, I'll say they're lower quality or whatever but just putting that aside they order something direct from a factory that a marketer in china has put on a u.s commerce site and they pack it up they put a label on it. And then how does it get to my house from a directly from a Chinese factory? Because it's being packed yeah. and labeled in China, correct? Yeah, it has to be labeled at origin. So it gets labeled there. Um, it gets flown over on freight, including a lot of this is flying on Flexport's uh, freight freighters. Um, gets handed off to what cleared customs uh, mm. and then handed off to a last mile provider. And that could be UPS. It could be USPS. It could be, you know, whoever's offering the best rates. Um and so that's who's delivering it to your door. So it's a kind how of end-to-end end transaction. How is this economically feasible is I, what I'm trying to figure out. What's yeah. the economics of this? Because I, I don't think there were shipping costs or the shipping costs were de minimis on this. Yeah, so, I don't, so, I don't um, you know, it's hard to say, but, you know, different customers have different business. Th- these companies have different business models that like, hey, maybe they're not making money at 20 
but I don't know. Those shoes might only cost two dollars to make, Jason. Yeah, I think that's what I don't it know. is. Yeah. I haven't seen them yet, but um, what would it cost somebody to ship a pair of shoes like that on an airplane to the United States um, and then do the last mile? Price it's, of price of air freight's about five bucks a kilo. How much do you think those things weigh? Kilos two two point two pounds might weigh they, a they pound. They gotta weigh ounces, pounds. right? So maybe maybe under a pound. Yeah, maybe, maybe under a pound. pound. So it's like two dollars fifty cents for the air freight. Wow, you know, last mile could be a couple bucks. So might only cost you five or six dollars door to door uh, on the freight side of things. It used to be worse. You know, Wish was doing this in a big way. Mm. Um, remember Wish. Now, it yeah. used to be worse in the sense that um, the U.S. government, until a few years ago, Trump closed this loophole. The government was actually subsidizing. Uh, it was called e-packet. And it was like this weird customs. Um, it was a weird postal treaty. And China was considered a developing world country. And so to like promote development there, you could ship something cheaper from China by USPS than you could from like North Carolina to New York. It was like Wild. cheaper to fly it from China to New York. Um, they closed that. It was pretty much a loophole. They closed that uh, because, you know, there's no reason for the government to be subsidizing this uh, cheap shipping like that. All right. Founders always ask me for pitch deck punch ups. And you know what? I got some great news for you. We worked with the team at Miro, the awesome whiteboarding software I've been talking about to create an amazing pitch deck template for founders, which you can see if you're watching the video right now, this is going to help bring your pitch deck from zero to hero from zero to VC ready. And our founder university participants love this template. We use it all the time. It saves them time and it gets them more meetings. So head to Miro.com slash Miroverse, M-I-R-O.com slash Miroverse and search for pitch neck to check it out and if your team is hybrid or fully remote miro is so useful for you it's like an old school in-person whiteboarding session but distributed and asynchronous so you can do it on your own time miro lets you brainstorm ideas and collaborate on projects from anywhere in the world when you think miro think zero to one but faster and miro is so much more than a simple digital whiteboard your team can collaborate on important stuff like research design planning and feedback cycles and faster inputs equals faster outcomes and we all know product velocity and startup velocity is how your company is going to win so to access our new miraverse template and thousands of others sign up today for a free miro account at miro.com slash startups m-i-r-o.com slash startups that's miro.com slash startups to sign up for free this was all i think created because of amazon third-party sellers in some way you know kind of in incepting in americans minds that there are these knockoff products or, you know, similar to products that you can buy for a lot cheaper. Yeah. Well, uh, Amazon's been lobbying um, quite a bit to close this loophole um, uh -huh. because it kind of, it hurts Amazon's business, you know, it, what's the point of having this like really impressive network of fulfillment centers all over the U S if you're not going to use them, you just bypass the whole thing and fulfill uh -huh. out of China. Um, so they've been doing quite a bit of lobbying, which is, uh, you know, a public record um, to close it. It's it it originates actually in the rules as an individual. If you're traveling internationally, you come home, you don't have yes. to file a formal customs entry. And eight hundred dollars is the threshold. You remember that next time yes. you're buying something. If yes. it's below eight hundred bucks, you're good. You don't have to deal with all the mm. paperwork and extra um, duties. You still have to declare it on the back of that little piece of paper, but you won't have to pay any customs duties. Once you get above eight hundred, now you're like, oh man, you got to file an entry and. Um, it would be a lot more painful. So that's where it originally comes from. And then um, it, it's called a type 86 clear. I, I probably nerd out too much for this, but the, the, the ability to do this like at, a, at scale where you can clear like 10,000 of them at once, because if you have to pay a customs broker to do a customs entry, well, we charge like a hundred bucks for that. So mm. that'll kill your whole, I can't charge you a hundred bucks for a customs entry on a $20 pair of shoes. So, right. but there's this manifest clearance, it's called, where you do 10,000 of them at once. Yes. It's, it's 100 bucks for that's all of 10,000. That's type 86. Yeah. Yeah, that's type 86. But section 321 is the section of the customs regulations that creates this law, the, this ability mm -hmm. to do this. Um, it's a very interesting phenomenon. It's like kind of taking the world by storm. It's like 30 to 50% of the air freight market, depending on the time of year, um. Um, which, you know, up from... Kind of, I don't know what it, I haven't seen the trend on what it what it was historically, so I need to go study that a little bit more. But I remember being very surprised when I learned it was like now fifty percent of the market in certain weeks and quarters. It's just extraordinary to think about this infrastructure that's been built over whatever it is the, I don't know less fifty years or hundred years of a factory in China. Somebody makes something there. It goes to some depot, which then goes to an airport, 
which then flies across the world, lands somewhere in the United States, and then goes to some depot again, I guess, and then gets delivered and it costs five bucks or 250 a pound. Yeah, well, that's, that's what's very different about this is like, you know, if you were to ship a FedEx package from China, it probably cost you 60, 70 bucks to get the same. Uh, uh, and so it's sort of avoiding that by paying bulk wholesale air freight rates. Mm. If you ship it with Flexport, you know, fly it on our set. We have 747. So we fly it in and then it lands in Chicago or LA. Mm. And there we have trucks that literally pull out next to the, tr um, next to the plane, get loaded right on the truck. It doesn't even go inside a building. It just gets put right on the truck and then shot down the road to UPS and UPS delivers at the last mile. So it's a, it's a pretty cool product. I had like mixed feelings about this whole thing. I'm like, Hey, what are we doing? Like, flying this stuff up and then i then i realized like actually flexport's pretty uniquely positioned to benefit from it because we have air freight yeah. customs and, and with our shopify logistics acquisition we have great contracts for the last mile delivery uh so yeah. it's made us a major player in this kind of e-commerce logistics so this gets rid of this idea of i don't know if it's called drayage or a fulfillment center like amazon has where you would order a hundred pairs of these shoes put them in a warehouse somewhere somebody would order them then you would ship them this is factory to, to consumer, correct? Yeah, or your fulfillment here. center is in China, effectively, uh, mm. instead of in the, or in Mexico or Canada. You know, you don't have to fly it. You can do this on ground uh. shipping where you put it up in Mexico or Canada. We'll see. There's a lot of efforts to lobby to get this to go away uh, for sort of obvious reasons. I mean, if you're going to have tariffs, like why... Uh, mm. not why why create a loophole? This? You know, what's yeah. the point of this? But there's also lobbying efforts to say, hey... You know, you should be able to do this out of a bonded, out of a free trade, foreign trade zone, which is a bonded warehouse in the United States. Uh, like Flexport has foreign trade zones that we operate that are oh. legally, technically not inside the commerce of the United States. But you're not allowed to do this clearance from one of those and send mm. it out. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of lobbying going on right now. There's a there's a bill um, in front of Congress that we're, we're monitoring all this stuff, but I, I don't have it, all the details in my head. But there's one bill out there that would eliminate it um, for shipments from China, but allow mm. it from other countries. Ah, there's another bill that would raise the threshold instead of lower. No, sorry, lower the threshold. So instead of being 800 bucks, it has to be below 200 bucks. Mm. which would you know limit the number of product the types of products that could be uh imported in this fashion so yeah it's it's pretty contentious and then there's a lot of different business models too where timu for example is a marketplace so it's like lots of different factories sending stuff they they consolidate it and then send it to you Sh shane is much more um kind of like make their own brand design their design their products yes kind of own it m let more first party and less third party although i think they have some third party aspects to it as well so that, that is kind of bypassing the Amazon fulfillment centers or the Flexport fulfillment centers. We now have uh, a bunch of these as well. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know how to feel about it. Like Flexport's pretty well positioned to do well in that world. We, we want to be. It's, it's interesting because like I, if it's going to last forever, then I got to invest and go, hey, let's go build some fulfillment centers in Canada and Mexico and be really great at it. But if Congress is going to change the law and make it go away overnight and like I'm you know less less excited to go do that. It also uh, creates a bunch of issues around the quality and safety of these products and, you know, trademarks and I intellectual property because the people who are selling in China, let's say, or, you know, pick another country, they might not have the same standards for safety, et cetera, and they're selling direct to a consumer. Whereas if it goes through Amazon, Amazon picks up some liability, yeah? Uh, well, I think with Amazon's stuff. marketplace, they avoid the liability as well. So it's kind of yeah. similar. There's a lot of third parties, you know, a lot of counterfeit issues. Cut sellers will tell you on Amazon as well. But it's um, they're still subject to the same rules and regulations for importing goods. It still has to be counterfeit, still illegal. Um, it, it does create some complexity for us on the compliance front to make sure that we are dialed in. Like you know, I, there's compliance for counterfeiting, which is important. But uh, compliance for dangerous goods for batteries in particular to not uh, sort of fire on an airplane. On an airplane like, that's yeah. like 10 times more important in my view, right? Like 1,000 times sure. more important um, yeah. just because people's lives are at risk. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's dialing in those compliance processes to make sure that everybody understands, like, here's what the rules are. The, the, you need... Um, I don't want to bore the audience, but material safety data sheet to like validate that there's been drop testing on the batteries and yes. all the, all these types of things need to be done to, to before you can put up, um, before you can put a battery on an airplane. 
Yeah, I mean, we had all kinds of weird stuff happen with batteries on airplanes. It's an interesting segue. I mean, I had this away bag that they put a built in battery pack where you can plug in your phone to your, you know, roller when you're getting on a plane. I came on the plane, the woman's like, Oh, is that one of the new ones with the battery pack? I was like, Yeah, she's like, Oh, you can't bring it on the plane. And I was like, Yeah, that was a setup. That was a setup. She asked me like, that's a she was personally interested in my away bag. And they changed that. But that was a weird one. Yeah. Yeah, that one's, uh, you know, that one always surprises me because, well, obviously they built the product for travel, so they should have sold that. But if it's in the passenger compartment, you are allowed to have battery, but they still make you take it out of the suitcase. It's like, it's kind of weird. Yeah. I get they, why you're not allowed to put it under this, underneath, because there's no one there to like monitor it and make sure yeah. it doesn't go if nuts. It does go yeah, it's, very, it's a very serious issue. Now, you can have a battery fire if it's designed the right way. Mm. The battery will sort of like collapse in on it. So the fire will collapse in on itself and not spread. Ah. It's a, like an elaborate, you know, engineering process. And that's why it's important that you do these things professionally and not have like random amateurs um, trying to do so. There is an interesting topic that's at work right now with these 737 maxes. I don't know if those are the planes you fly, but you saw the, the door come no, off. We got 747s, but yeah, I saw that. That's crazy. And, and you know, my friend Sky Dayton um, from Earthlink and Boingo fame, he just wrote a blog post about this, about just training of pilots. He's a pilot, a uh, close friend of mine. And they're really having challenges now with the number of pilots available and their training and are they getting enough hours? And it turns out they're pushing them to put a lot of hours, not in the simulator, but into like, you know, SESTA 172s and the training and stuff like that. Tell me, is, is there, are there issues right now around flying stuff around the globe? Is that, and you, you starting to see that with pilot shortages and, and uh, safety with planes? Um, there've been a lot, you know, a lo all these airlines, sort of a self-created problem. They, they laid all their pilots off during COVID. Um, a lot of them did and they've had to rehire. And then you, you definitely see it like much younger pilots, like trying to find, you know, training random in fact, it's, I'm, I'm very proud. We've had like six or seven Flexport employees in Asia who were doing freight forwarding work, which is like working with factories to get documents, coordinating shipments, shipping stuff that have become pilots for major airlines. Wow. I, I just found this out. I was in Asia two weeks ago and I was like, oh, yeah, this guy left here. He's now a pilot at Cathay Pacific. I was like, really? What? That's so wow. cool. Uh, but yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of opportunities have been created there. Lot of, what I heard from the team there was that a lot of the... Um, the experienced pilots got went to the Middle East. A lot of the Middle Eastern yeah. airlines were still hiring and, and attracted away a lot of the pilots out of the Asian airlines who had shut down completely. And the Middle mm. Eastern airlines kept operating or else they had wow. deeper pockets or whatever. So, um, and they're growing a lot. So yeah, interesting um, dynamic, but I don't think it's creating, it hasn't been a big challenge uh, that, that, ex that hits us in the freight world. I just like hear about it anecdotally. Okay, you've seen Sun and I demo a ton of AI tools, and we've learned that these tools are going to help you do so much more with less. That means more revenue and less overhead. But here's the hard part for a lot of companies. How do you actually integrate your AI into your daily workflow? Well, you got to check out CureTech. CureTech specializes in strategic consulting and product engineering for AI tools. CureTech starts with strategic consulting, and they bring those ideas to life with their expert engineering teams. They offer a few key services, AI strategy road mapping. These are collaborative sessions to find out where AI can give you and your company a competitive edge. AI-powered SaaS features, where they're going to strategize, design, and even write the code for your AI SaaS product, and they'll help you automate repetitive tasks. So here is your call to action. CureTech is offering their $10,000 AI strategic roadmapping service for 50% off. This includes up to three 90-minute sessions to find opportunities for AI in your business, a comprehensive breakdown of these opportunities, and a technical roadmap to make the solutions a reality. So go check out curatech.com slash twist and get $5,000 off. That's C-U-R-O-T-E-C dot com slash twist. C U R O T E C dot com slash twist. Let's get the update on what's going on in the Red Sea. You you came on all in the other week and talked about it a little bit, and then I've been watching you on Twitter. Man, it, you, you shared one graphic of people going around. Is that Cape Horn at the at the end of? Uh, uh, no, no, uh, that's uh, Cape of Good Hope. Cape Horn is South America. Cape of Good oh, Hope. Cape is Horn Africa, South yeah. America, and yeah. Cape Good Hope is that the one? Cape uh, of Good Hope. Yep. Cape of Good Hope, which by the way is one of the most dangerous turns you can make around a continent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the southern, the southern Ocean is pretty crazy, especially, we're, it, it, I th my understanding is that the winter is, I've never been down there, but I think the winter is way worse. 
Um, so we'll see. It's right now it's summer down there. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so we'll see dead. if that. I, I do. I have heard. You know, it's not. It's non-trivial to send container ships through those waters in the winter. Um, so hopefully this gets resolved in the next six months. But um, people are just electing to take the long route right now, just to avoid the possibilities. Yeah. In, in yeah, some so it's, large it's way. somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of the container ships are uh, routing around the red sea wow um about 30 percent of all container ships flow through the suez regularly throughout their journeys uh so it's a huge disruption to global trade to go around it takes 20 to 25 percent longer mm. um is really you know we talked about this on the on, on the all in pod but it, it it's a real challenge to the american-led order like post-world war ii where we said like hey we're going to patrol this freedom of the navigation anybody can trade with anybody else we'll have this globalized world peace and harmony and anybody can you know anybody can do business with anybody else as long as you're not part of the soviet bloc or something that was kind of the, the post-world war ii american-led order and if all of a sudden, you know, the U.S. Navy sends a carrier strike group to the Red Sea and it's still not enough to keep it open for navigation and they're still able to hit ships with missiles, you're kind of like, huh, like, what is that? It does make you think about the United States' role and uh, in terms of being the global police officer and people being scared of pissing off the United States, you know, and, and if we don't serve that function, then who is? And I know for America, we... There's a lot of people in America who maybe don't want to be the world cop, but then if we're yeah, not... Yeah, but a lot of people around the world who don't want us to be the world cop too. Like, yeah. we don't make a lot of friends when we go invade these countries. A lot of European countries are like, no, stop doing that, you know? Yeah. So, it, it, and, and the Suez really benefits Europe and China and Asia much more than the United States. I mean, we barely use it. We use it for shipments from India, mm. like Indian subcontinent, Middle East to the East Coast. Uh, that's the that's the route where the Suez would be the fastest way to to deliver. Where you go through the Red Sea, across the Mediter the Suez, across the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic Ocean, and hit the U.S. East Coast. But if you're going anywhere from China to the U.S. East Coast, you're better to go across the Pacific and through the Panama Canal. Yeah, from China to the West Coast, obviously, you just go straight across the Pacific. So we're it's an interesting role for the United States. Like, should we go patrol? the ocean on behalf of European countries who like they themselves don't seem to want to send their navies down there to do it other than France. I think it's very interesting right now. France has got their Navy in mm. the red sea and only protecting French ships. Uh, and oh, the French ships keep going through. That's, you know, I said 90 to 95%. Ah. The ones that keep going are the French ones. And it's a very, it, yeah. yeah. And it's really like a return, like before world war two, this is how trade worked was like, yeah, your yeah, Navy guns existed on your for this purpose. That's and why you, went you and traded had a with Navy. your colonies. Like you had colonies out there and you wow. traded with your colonies and you had a navy to protect your ships and make sure no pirates or foreign um, navies yeah. conquered, you know, captured it's them. Kind of so, every man for themselves kind of approach, right? Like yeah, I hope you not. Would. I hope not. You know, I think um yeah. the argument, the counter arguments are like, well, why should the US do this if it's not if it benefits Europe more and leave it to them? It's sort of like, well, it's not a zero sum world and the US benefits from global prosperity and you know, rising tide lifts all boats like everybody else. Everybody being better off is good quite, for America, even if relatively they're sense. more better yeah. off than we are. But Quite literally in this sense, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. I mean, you would think that this is an area where the United States, France, and China, and India could collaborate. These are all yeah. major trading partners, manufacturers, consumers. This would be a great opportunity for Xi Jinping and Biden or, you know, whoever to just get together and say, you know what? Yeah, we all have an interest in making sure that this route stays open and defending ships because we're sellers, you're buyers. It, why don't we put some, you know, uh, ships from China and the US in that trade and say, yeah, you can't, you can't attack commercial ships. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's why I don't think this is gonna last that, that long. You know, like the rational brain says, hey, there's too many interests aligned here, too many superpowers. Even mm. India, like last week, um, sent their special forces, their Navy because there was a ship that had been um, hijacked or basically taken over by pirates off the coast of Somalia. Oh. And it was Indian sailors on board. It was Indian owned. Mm. And the Indian special forces went on board and cleared the ship. Yeah, clear. Um, a, but that's kind of interesting, right? Like yeah. that's, you would normally think that's the role of the United States Navy, but the Indian Navy stepping up. So yeah, we might. I, it's I, like, everybody, I like everybody stepping up and being part of it and having a dialogue about this because you know, when you have bad actors, um, it's good for them to get a united front from 
and hear from different voices like, hey, this behavior is not going to be acceptable. We're going to we're going to stop it. I'm curious what markets, you know, I, you keep hearing and you have your, your finger on the pulse of this, that, you know, some people are moving factories out of China. I tried to explain this on all in. I kind of got a little, I think Chamath laughed at me and some other folks were like, yeah, uh, Apple's never going to make the iPhone in India. And sure enough, Apple's making the iPhone in India and they're making more recent versions of it from what I understand. So is India and Vietnam, be, are, are those two areas specifically, and I think also Indonesia becoming, you know, major players in terms of more advanced manufacturing and you're seeing more shipping coming out of those areas now? Yeah, absolutely. Vietnam, a uh, huge winner, lots of manufacturing, lots of manufacturing shifting out of China. Um, and it has been for like 10, 15 years for the low end, kind of where it's just about labor arbitrage. Because mm. China is not the cheapest. Mexico has a Mexican labor cost is now about half uh, of Chinese, uh, Chinese yeah. labor, like dollars per hour that you pay to the workers. And I don't know if that's yeah. productivity adjusted, probably not. And then of course, the tariffs have impacted been a very real and impacted mm. businesses and a lot of decisions. And then some of it's just brand like companies just don't feel as good about the, Chi the Chinese brand as they did. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, you see that Vietnam's the biggest winner so far. But Vietnam, big country as it is, is like, less than 10% of the population of China. Yeah, it's 109 it has or so, right? Yeah. Really weak infrastructure. I mean, there's yeah. the two biggest uh, cities um, are Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. They're not connected by a freeway. I mean, it's like red light, stoplight the whole way Crazy. You know, between these two mega urban centers. Vietnam does benefit. They have um, great rivers. Mm. And a lot of the ocean, a lot of the container shipping actually flows on the rivers because the trucks, the roads are so bad. Huh. Um, and so we do a ton of barge shipping in Vietnam, bringing it out of the country down to the uh, to the coast and put it on a container ship there. Um, but it's um, it just doesn't really have the infrastructure. It's happening fast. They're building that freeway as we speak there. Uh, but yeah, big factories there, Samsung, Apple, lots of these major companies yeah. have huge factories in especially around Hanoi, uh, North Vietnam um, and India as well. So. And then Mexico is the other big, the, the other biggest winner right now. But it's kind of, there is no other China. It's like a lot of other countries kind of coming up at once. This is a long term pattern, though. You know, it used to be you go to Taiwan and Korea and Japan for cheap manufacturing. Yeah, and then they become more advanced, and China has become more advanced, and manufacturing has moved to for the cheap stuff has moved to cheaper places. But Chamath yeah. is also kind of right, like for really high end electronics, high end manufacturing, like Apple, still the best. You can hear Tim Cook talk about why. Apple, yeah. like for manufacturing the high, the best products in the world is still China is the best place to do it. Yeah. Um, although just the, the fact that they, I think got the, cause it used to be, they made like the, the maybe four or five generations ago in India, but now they, they move the 14 or 15, I think uh, is now being made there. So it's super fascinating and yeah, really interesting. Uh, Vietnam ranks highly 19th of 141 countries in terms of linear shipping connectivity. However, the efficiency of seaport services ranks 83rd, according to the World Economic Forum. Yeah, yeah, 83rd is pretty bad, man. Yeah, so their ports are terrible, but they do have tons of rivers, so that means potential. They have great it, potential. It's a lot of the roads that are bad. Mm. Um, but even, even like rivers, you know, I was just meeting with the largest, I was in um, Singapore a couple weeks ago, and I met with the largest logistics company in Vietnam. The owner flew over to meet with me because we're big partners. Uh, we have a JV with them. And they, um, they, do, they, own, four bar they own four river ports. So they're doing this barge shipping. They run all these barges on the rivers. And he was explaining to me how, you know, the shape of these boats is like, can we make them bigger? Like, how can we get more volume throughput? And he's like, well, yeah. we can make them longer, but we've already hit the length of what's legal. So we're like trying to convince the government to make them longer. I was like, why don't we make them taller? He's like, well, there's 200 bridges, ah, you know, along the, the way. Bridge they're like, this yeah, high. Yeah. You can't go yeah. any higher. And like, <laughs> they're not, you know, if you're going to make every bridge higher, like you're talking, you might as well make a better freeway or something. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. When you're in the startup business, you should always be looking for a performance edge. There are simple ways to do this, like getting better sleep. We all know that. But let me tell you about a little hack that elite athletes and U.S. military members use. It's called Ketone IQ. A bunch of the quantified self people like Andrew Huberman have been talking about the benefits of ketones recently. And Ketone IQ is a ketone shot that was developed through a contract with DARPA to make American soldiers sharper. You can think of ketones as nature's brain fuel. They have a bunch of proven health benefits like improved focus and weight loss, and Ketone IQ is a clean energy boost with no sugar and no caffeine. I have been on it for a couple of months now, and my energy level has gone up, 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 and my focus as well. 
I love taking these shots. I take it in the morning before I work out. I take it when I'm skiing. And man, it makes you feel like a superhero. So here's the call to action. Get 30% off your first subscription to Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash twist. That's hvmn.com slash twist for 30% off. Or you can easily find Ketone Dash IQ at your local Sprouts Market. It comes in little bottles and you just take this little shot. Boom, you're off to the races. Let's uh, pivot the discussion to this CEO drama. Uh, you decide uh, that you were going to become a venture capitalist. You were going to hand over Flexport. Let's take that first decision. This is a very hard decision for a founder to make. Why did you make that decision to hand the reins over to begin with? Because usually I see that, hey, man, people are burnt out or they feel like, hey, maybe I, you know, there's somebody better than me to, for the next phase. Hey, maybe zero to one. I'm this creative person scaling i need somebody maybe who's a little more boring but is obsessed with scaling so let's start with that first chapter there why did you make that decision that you wanted to try not being the ceo of the company you co-founded yeah um there are separate decisions by the way that being the vc came much later was not pre-planned right. um, so it wasn't like it was, the allure of being a vc no no not at all, not at all. um <laughs> yeah. it was it really was that of like I want just the best for Flexport. And I think Flexport has a huge lead in technology in our industry. Like it's an old school industry. It's been around for thousands of years. We're the only freight forwarder in the top 100 freight forwarders in the world. There's only one that was founded after Netscape was invented in 94, ah. the web browser, and that's Flexport. Like we're the third largest in the US. And so we have a big lead on tech. But I, so I think it's kind of, I don't know, comparing yourself to the it's not, the, it's not the bar that I want to clear being the best at tech in yeah. the freight forwarding industry, right? Uh, which I would like to z be as, as good as Amazon, like, or as good as Google. Like, I'd, and I don't think we're reaching that level. So on the one hand, I want to go faster in building technology. Uh, and two is, I do think Amazon's the best logistics tech company in the world. Um, still, mm -hmm. I can say that even though I aspire to be that with Flexport, it's like Amazon, it's, I can't claim we're better than Amazon at building logistics technology. Um, and so when I had the opportunity, I was looking for a, an operator and a, to help me on both those areas like tech and operational rigor, efficiency, mm. reliability metrics. Like, can you quantify it? Can you mm. put in all the processes to dial it in? And I just look at Amazon and just find it to be so amazing. Right. And so I was looking for a partner. Um, one of the things I'll do when I'm trying to recruit an exec is uh, talk to investment bankers because um, mm. they know a lot of people. And they, want, mm. they all want to do Flexport's IPO. So I just kind of like put the word out there. Hey, here's the profile I'm looking for. A lot of people go to headhunters. I like to, headhunters like charge it, you a lot yeah. of money. And you know, the bankers, like they got, they want to make this, they're trying to jockey for position for our IPO. Yeah, they so, want to do you a solid. This is a really yeah, good favor. They make can them do work for, you. for it, right? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. so I had a um, banker kind of put, gave him the spec. I told him, hey, here's what I'm looking for. He's like, oh, you should hire Dave Clark. I was like, oh, come on, man. Uh, He's the CEO of Amazon. Like, retail consumer yeah. business like don't be a crazy. target like, i could hit yeah and so he yeah exactly and he was like hey, i might be open to it let's talk to him and turned out he was um and so it was very opportunistic because i was really trying to hire like a coo uh and mm -hmm. i kind of caught a whale and it became pretty apparent that i you know just talking to him and getting to know him and his experience it was like really see him like working yeah he had to work for me as the chairman of the board but like working for me as CEO, like what would I own? What am I responsible for? What am I going to be better and more experienced? Mm. And which decisions would I own? So I made a, it made the decision. Like I thought he'd be better at building the tech, running the operational side of things um, and, and dialing it in mm. to, to where we could, you know, be the most reliable, efficient, and therefore affordable logistics company in the world. So yeah, it was really just done to like make Flexport better. Mm. And then it, quickly went sideways you had him in there for a year or so you weren't happy with the performance the board wasn't happy to the extent you can go into it uh maybe you could talk about when you just realized uh i need to come back and i made a mistake in leaving or i made a mistake in hiring this person or both i don't know what you conclusion you came to there but it did get a little spicy publicly uh, obviously yeah it was a little unfortunate i mean very unfortunate the um you know, I, well, one of the things that happened, which was really unfortunate and annoying, was that um, journalists kind of dug up a bunch of drama that didn't exist. Uh, oh, I'm shocked. And then really spun it up and made it worse. Uh, made really? it, like, created drama out of thin air. So they told, they interviewed somebody, like some former employee, hmm. um, who told him all this stuff about Dave that wasn't true. Oh. Like, actual allegations. There were some allegations of, like, fraud. 
I mean, it was in this article and it's like claiming all these things uh, and said it was from a source close to Flexport and told, and then called Dave and told Dave, Ooh. this was, I, I think it was someone that he fired who didn't Got like him. him. Well, this, and this uh, is important for people to understand when you're the boss and you have to fire people or layoffs for cause, not for cause, or you beat competitors or somebody doesn't, a VC doesn't get an allocation. You just start building up these people who have resentment towards you. Fair well, or and this is how journalists operate, you know, they're always going to find somebody disgruntled somebody out there yeah. with some story and like, you know, maybe there's a half truth to it. But in this case, it was completely fabricated uh, and mm. then told Dave it was someone close to the company. Right. So and they so weaponized they, Dave, it. Dave then thought I was the one <laughs> saying bad things about him. And he's like, oh, if they're going to make these allegations against me, we we're go. at war and started attacking the company. It's just like spiraled. And we never, you know, we were very careful to go back and look like we never said bad things about him. Like never, there were, these allegations weren't true. There was mm. a decision made by our board that like, hey, we do have to change direction of the company. Um, we've got to pivot pretty hard towards profitability. Dave was going big. Dave was like, all out there let's conquer the world we have a big lead on technology yeah. in a massive multi-trillion dollar industry We've got a great balance sheet let's go after it like let's mm. go dominate this industry hired 800 software engineers we grew our soft our tech team from like 400 to 1300 wow in a year in like nine months we've been you know going really big and the board made this decision they're like hey this isn't the right path we've got mm. to get we got to build towards profitability, which means we have to cut costs. Um, we also need to maintain Flexport's like very entrepreneurial culture of customer, like intimacy, like how we meet with customers and grow with the customer and how we build the culture of our team. Um, and that's a very hard job for a hired CEO to do, to both be like, mm. I'm cutting costs and I care about the culture a lot. Yeah. And it was just like kind of clear that this would be a better role for the founder to go, all right, yeah, I got to cut costs. Sucks. It'll let people go. But I genuinely, and people know me at Flexport, I've got uh, enough people that believe in, in, that understand me and my love for the company and, and for the people of the company mm. to say like, yeah, I genuinely do care about the culture, even as I do. You know, it's a really hard challenge to be saying I'm going to cut costs and invest in the culture. I'm going to improve quality like on time performance and operational efficiency, all these things while cutting costs. Like these are and these a, transitions, it's a hard thing for a hired CEO to do. Transitions are like this are never easy. And this occurred during uh, a market uh, collapse. Yeah. This all happened during yeah, 21, so the, 22, you know, that, 23. There's definitely some aspect of it that's related. Um, the, the freight, the price of freight came down about 90, 80 to 90%. Um, but that's, we knew that was going to happen. You know, it was in our forecast. It happened faster. It happened about six months faster. We had kind of like drawn it as like a smoother curve. But like at the end of the day, it wasn't the deciding factor. Like it was much more just looking at our business and just taking a clean look at like what's growth look like? Are we hitting our growth targets? Like what are the customer experiences? What's the customer feedback? Like what do we need to do? Um, we, had, we had hired a lot of people, probably hired too fast, like takes a while to get people in. We have a very complex business to get hired a lot of big leaders out of Amazon. Uh, great people, but it just takes time to like get to know a new culture, a new company, a new industry. The indus although we're on logistics, it's quite different. Um, they're in consumer logistics. You don't have to talk to the customer. They're not really doing sales. AWS side does sales, but the Amazon side is like its own flywheel. We're, yeah, you, we're you a B2B. Just you're not B2B getting on a provider. call and taking complaints or getting product requests from your customers at Amazon. Yeah, they're just yeah, I'm signing like, up for I'm, Prime and they're done. Yeah. You know, I, I make sure to talk to at least one customer every day. And like the last, my first 90 days back in the job, I talked to 100 and did video calls to 130 customers in 90 wow. days. So like it was, uh, it, well, 90 days, less 90 days uh, is includes yeah, the weekends, doing, right? Yeah. Uh, so you're doing two or three calls a day with customers. Yeah, there were some days I was doing eight or 10. I mean, I was, it was, it was deliberate. I was trying to really get out there, send a lead from the front, send that signal to our teams. Like, Hey, I really care about the customer. But also I wanted to document everything. Like, mm. what do we need to do? How do we win? What do these customers need to see from us? Uh, and we've been really acting on that feedback over the last, really since I got back in the job. Such a great technique to just email a customer and say, can we talk about your experience with our product? do a quick zoom would really appreciate it. Uh, and, and a lot of 
a lot of founders I find don't do this. They get disconnected from it. And it's almost like the machine tries to pull you away from getting this direct feedback. You know, you, yeah. all the customer support teams like, we got this boss, the sales team and the customer success teams like, don't worry, we'll send you a report. They almost try to block you from having it's that direct contact. It's a very hard thing to do to be a leader of a large organization and, and live in reality and find out what's really happening because people want... Yeah, mm -hmm. reality might look bad if you're the person owning that problem. Like, well, I don't want to tell my boss about this terrible thing that's yeah. happening under my watch. Um, so yeah, talking to customers directly, talking to frontline employees directly, shadowing them, doing the work mm -hmm. yourself, like seeing what that looks like. It, uh, those are just crucial. And then the other one is just like build your own financial model mm -hmm. uh, of the business that's simple enough for caveman, whatever level of sophistication you may have. For me, it's mm -hmm. kind of caveman level of for uh, financial modeling. I do have an MBA, but I'm like financial modeling caveman skills. Yeah. Uh, but it's my model is better, honestly, because I understand it. It's not as I can play with it. There's only three or four assumptions that really matter. And I go, okay, this is what really matters from a financial perspective. Here's what really matters from a customer perspective. Here's what really matters from the frontline employees perspective. And that's kind of all you really need to, to leave. This is something I, I did for a long time when I was on airplanes and they didn't have pre-internet days is I would build models of my media businesses. Okay, we have 10 blogs at Weblogs Inc. Okay, we got in gadgets making this much money. It's got this cost. We're doing this many blog posts. And I just say, how many blog posts do we need to do to have a hit blog? What do we need to pay people? How much traffic does each blog post get? Uh, how many ads, how many impressions, what's the CPM, what's the remnant inventory worth, I just would build like a little model in, in an Excel document. And boy, does it like help you build this mental model and having the ability to just take out a moleskin and, and or, you know, do it in an Excel and build it from the bottom up yourself. And, and really think about the assumptions it just creates clarity, just like writing creates creates clarity for a person. Yeah. Or if you are playing a chess game, and you do a recap of your chess game, and you have to explain every move like chess.com will replay the game for you and tell you when you made mistakes. All of a sudden you become a much better player of the game. Yeah, distilling it down to something very simple, like not outsourcing that to your finance department. Of course, the finance department needs to build a more complicated model that factors in all the different segments and different things. But like, uh, I just like it to be super simple and I can understand there's probably three or four variables that really matter. And then go, okay, for each of those, what are the three or four things we're going to do? to get the number to where we need it to be. And uh, yeah, it's very eye opening. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it got messy, you came back, you listened to all the customers, you got the company right size, Bill Gurley and Brad Gerson, we did a little podcast last week on this week in startups little roundtable. And we're talking about IPOs. When's the right window to IPO? They're kind of of the thought, you know, you know, when you get to that 100 million, 200 million, which I understand you guys are, you know, somewhere in that zone. You know, getting public earlier and getting that discipline is a good thing. You've probably gotten, I don't think you've ever taken a company public. So what's the advice you've gotten on when you should go public? The earliest advice, the later advice, staying private longer, because it seems like there's a, a lot of varying views on this, staying private longer, yeah. getting public uh, earlier. Well, in general, you know, it's very hard to give generic advice on these things. Every, every company is different. Um, so I'll tell you what, how we think about Flexport is, yeah, we'd like to go public as soon as, as soon as we have one, I'd like to be profitable or like real line of sight to profitability. We have that right now, but I don't think we have uh, enough credibility of our own. Like one is credibility to the investment community, our investor community of hitting our results. We've not, we've not hit, we've had a couple of bad quarters where we missed pretty badly what we thought we were going to hit. So like getting to where we're like, hey, we reliably like we can forecast the business. Um, and that that's a discipline that we're putting in the right systems and processes. So there's a maturity there that we should have by now, but we're behind on where we should be in predictability. Yeah. And uh, like, of course, the freight market, we're never gonna be able to predict the ups and downs of the freight market. I mean, look, the Red Sea just spiked freight rates like 3x like um, COVID and that stuff. But there's a level of like even within what should be predictable that we need to improve our processes. Um, and then, yeah, we'd like to be, we'd like to be a profitable cost, uh, company. Um, I've got the whole team geared right now to try to get that done this year, like end of the year, not, not going public, but be profitable for the quarter in Q4 and then for the full year next year uh, in 2025. That's gotta be inspiring for well, folks, yeah? 
I hope so. You know, I don't think getting profitable is the most inspiring goal that you can pick in the world, to be honest. Like, it is for me as the founder. I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know. Doesn't but, it make people um, feel safe or, or like this is a real business? This isn't one of the it should, it should, yeah. crazy companies. I would think that for the right team it members, should. We're, we're, it should we're make you feel stable, right? right? We're driving yeah. that right now. And I hope everybody at Flexport is out there is like, yeah, all in on that goal. But not, mm. uh, not everyone in the world thinks like you and me. So I'm not sure everybody in the world is like, oh, we get profit, profit, profit. You want to have a some level of higher calling of what we try to do around helping customers and serving, you know, serving the, the wider world. But definitely, you don't get to do any of that if you're not in a profitable business. So and then my view is, hey, once we're profitable, we've got a degree of predictability, you got the right compliance processes, it's our bains oxley and all the other stuff that goes in the IPO process and go public as soon as you can. So um, but uh, we're not thinking about it that much. We're thinking all day, all day about the profitability, working a lot of hard work. Um, our business is much harder, much more complicated than most businesses because on on a given Flexport transaction, you're moving in, a let's just say an ocean freight container. We also do air freight, we do like parcels and everything else, but just take a ocean freight container on a single transaction, moving that container from Vietnam, what I was just mentioning, down the river port on a barge, putting it on ocean carrier, clearing customs, delivering it, clear customs, pick it up with a truck, maybe bring it to a warehouse, translate it, maybe bring it up, put it on a rail, then take it off, clear customs, take it to a warehouse, unload it, then put it on a truck. There's insurance. There's a bank that's doing a wire transfer for the customer. There's like eight, 10, you can have 18 vendors literally on this transaction and they're billing us We've got to capture their bill, make sure they build us the right amount, make sure they actually provided the service that they were supposed to provide, that their bill is not in some way wrong. Uh, then that we actually build the cut, you know, added that through correctly and then charged the customer the right amount and made to make money. Uh, and the margins are pretty thin in global logistics. Like it's not Google AdWords. Like you've got to really dial those processes. So uh, you know, in the helter skelter days of just growing 16x in a year, you don't always have every single process dialed on all these things. So that's kind of the maturity level that we're at right now is putting in dialed in processes for these things, making sure you know, the right controls, the right audits, all that stuff, um, level of maturity that's needed if you want to be go be a public company. So we're working our butts off right now to get it done. Yeah. And you talk a little bit about the global workforce and what you're seeing in that regard you are a truly global business and one of the trends i'm seeing in startups and listen you're a much more mature company now but you still have that startup ethos i'm seeing a lot of folks saying you know what in america it's too hard to hire too hard to inspire maybe there's on the margin some entitlement here or there and there are other places where people really want work really need work maybe uh more commitment maybe uh more affordability so, so how are you thinking about building out this global team and where you're putting talent and, and where you're seeing talent emerge that really makes an impact in your company? Yeah, and we're super global pretty much from day one, the nature of Flexport. One, yeah. It's the, the curse and the, the beautiful thing about the business. Um, yeah. We've, we've got um, employees in 40 different offices around the world wow. and, uh, and then some contractors and more um, doing kind of like BPO data entry, some of these service, uh, back office type processing stuff, freight audit and stuff like yeah. that. Um, the wage disparities are pretty crazy. Honestly, it's one of these things that's kind of hard right? to get your head around where you pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the U S and 20,000 bucks in Asia, not for the same work, but like, Hey, if it's one tenth the price, uh, you could have three people doing it. Like, yeah. Yeah, this is a mistake to just go chase things based on labor alone. Like that's companies have done that for years. You get this call center that's on the other side of the world. And it's just yeah. like, I don't know, we never will outsource like customer support or even offshore customer support. Like I want that to be close to the customer. There's a lot of value to culture, the mm. culture of being in the market close to your, your the same culture as your customer. Uh, sure. I believe in that. Um I think Americans are amazing at customer service globally, yeah. like just like pretty well, we friendly, expected, awesome right? people. Yeah. yeah. And like we have this idea of tipping. Yeah. That you know, <laughs> we don't tip our freight forwarder, but like we tip our waiters and you get good you get better customer service from a waiter in the US than like well, they, they you know how they solve this in China is they just assign a waiter to your table who just stands next to your table the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, <laughs> we're going to make sure that this service is elite. <laughs> service is not real good. We're tying you to the table. You're <laughs> table 10. 
Um, um, so yeah, there's a different ways we're at it. Um, software engineering is very interesting. You know, a lot of what we do is pretty basic, like web forms and databases and like, you know, some of yeah. what we do is more sophisticated AI and machine learning. Algorithms, machine learning. Algorithms, yeah, some that. really interesting uh, data science algorithms and planning and some of that stuff. Um, but you, you know, we're finding people are really good at this at our engineering sites in Asia and, and, and yeah. uh, Amsterdam has been a great site for us as well. Oh, wow. Um, the Dutch, the Dutch government has a great, um, kind of incentive program might be the way to frame it, but like a way to attract you to come to the country. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so we've, we've participated there. We've got a nice setup. We've been in Amsterdam as our European headquarters, uh, almost since yeah year two or something mm. in the company. So yeah, it's definitely something you study more and more, but we're very cautious not to just go and outsource just to find lower factor costs. You want to go like, hey, where's the talent? It really map. Yeah, to you want to follow the talent and then what you're trying to do. It's a, a, a you know, I'm not a remote work proponent. I said that was exactly where I was going next because a lot of this, you know, global workforce seems to be at least in startups. They're saying, well, people don't want to come to the office in the U.S. and I'm managing somebody in the U.S. who's working for $150,000 a year as a full stack developer or salesperson, but they're in this like low cost place and they don't come to an office. And we the person tried managed, it. We tried yeah. it. It didn't work. We're, in, mm. we're back to the office. Uh, there's some resistance to that, but, uh, but you know, I'm the CEO, so we're not doing it. Um, and yeah. it's going to be in office most of the time default, like it was before. You don't need to be, you know, the police on this stuff, but like the, the default assumption is you come to the office and do your work. Like if you need to yeah. be at home for a good reason, like we're reasonable people, but, um, yeah, no, if your but, kid's you know, sick, your kid's sick. If, uh, yeah, so sure. you miss daycare, um, it's all good, but yeah. Yeah, totally. And like, we're, I, you know, I tell our, especially our parents, like, Hey, we're a global logistics business. It's global logistics is 24 seven, 365. Like it doesn't take Christmas off. Like the ships are yeah. still moving. The planes are moving. Um, and so we expect like, it's a hard job because, you know, the earth is round and you've got to get stay up late to talk to someone on the other side of the world. And we ask a lot of our people, but with that comes like, it doesn't mean you have to work 15 hours a day, but you might go home early, spend some time with your kids in the afternoon and then go work three hours. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you're dealing with the Middle East or China, yeah, you might be doing 10 to 2 a.m. A lot of our jobs are like that. And so, mm -hmm. hey, you know, like it, it that doesn't mean I need you to come to the office every time you do a phone call or something. But uh but we've just found people are so much more productive in the office. It's so much better for culture. Now, there's another way to run a company, which mm -hmm. is all remote. Um, but if you're doing that, you know, it's not guys that look like you that want to live in like Tahoe, Jason, that are going to yeah. hang out and, and uh, make 250 grand a year going skiing four hours a day and then do, you know, <laughs> two, go back two, to yeah. two, two hours a day. Yeah, two, course, hours, two, two hours, hours a day and then go back to the job. Like yeah. it, it's going to be geniuses in the developing world who cost one tenth of what you cost. Yes. Um, yes. And come, you know, the winners in that, I, I think there'll be very interesting companies that are built on this model who are going like, mm. let's figure out how to find the hidden talent yep. in these countries. Are there people who have like, you know, rock star, they would have gotten a what's SAT 1600 on the SAT yeah. and you yeah, know, but they're, they're, but they're in Bangladesh or they're Sri Lankan or they're Pakistan yeah. or India. And, and, and they're, they're just, just like, Un unappreciated talent pools yeah is. and those people out there and they're watching this show probably they're studying totally YouTube, they're they learning are. to code yeah. i think there's kind of two models one is like you're in person and you're working your butts off as like a team that's going hardcore and the other is oh we our labor cost is one tenth as much and our team is okay we only have 80 percent of the culture and the drive and the you know, but at one tenth the cost, you could probably build something interesting there. But it's not our business. Our business is global logistics. Like the the strong expectation is, well, if, you know, you're going to be in person and and often at the port or the warehouse or doing some work like touching the freight, making sure that things get coordinated. And our business is very complex. You know, I was mentioning it's 18 transactions, but there's a lot of co coordination that has to happen. It's cross functional. It's cross disciplinary. That's you just got to have relationships. Uh, it can't just happen on Zoom, everything pre-scheduled meetings. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I know this is becoming a big industry because I keep seeing requests for like DL. I don't know if you know that company, DEL, for like hiring contractors remote. All these companies are now abstracting how to do contractor payments around the world. And one startup was dealing with a group of folks and they're like, we want to be paid in cryptocurrency. And you're like, okay, how do we pay you in cryptocurrency in your country? Like, is that even legal or whatever? And it's like, yep, just please use, you know, this platform. I don't know if it was DL or remote or plain. There's like all these providers 
that are now doing this abstraction for you. Take the talent, yeah. get them paid in crypto. Rippling has a product for that now too. Yeah. So all of them are kind of figuring that all out. And they, they wouldn't have those products. They wouldn't be solving those problems with software and operations if there wasn't demand for it. So I, oh, I, it's I, huge, I, man. And, and like, you know, I mean, my business, uh, my businesses before Flexport were not venture backed. They're mm. bootstrapped, profitable businesses. Mm. And so we did all of our software development, mm. uh, back office work in the Philippines. And we've been doing that since the late nineties. Yeah. And, mm. uh, that, you know, when you're not venture backed, it's not a, necessarily a choice. Like all you can afford is a couple engineers at a much lower price. And yep. And you manage them really tightly to get the quality that you want. And you've you got to do the design yourself yeah. and be all over it and make sure it's good. And like, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, and I think there's, there's a real space in the ecosystem for those businesses. I think it's pretty cool having run a venture back business, like just a different kind of discipline that comes with it. Uh, yeah. being a bootstrap business, like much yeah. more. And, and I think that venture businesses are n new world that we're in will benefit from learning those skills of being way more. If you can like, be more cash efficient at the early stage, you can maintain the cap table, you need less capital, and maybe you can go faster, right? And you can be faster and lighter. And we're seeing that now I'll see companies that we're looking at angel investing in. And I'm like, you have 12 employees are like, yeah, I'm like, what do you spend every month? And they're like, we're spending 70. And I'm like, 6,000 an employee. And they're like, Oh, no, 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 it's like 4,000 employee, but we have servers. And we've got this other thing we're doing, we're doing some paid marketing. I'm like, wait, how are you spending $45,000 per employee? Like, oh, well, we have like two people in the US. We got 10 people offshore for this amount, 12,000 a year to 40,000 a year. And you, oh, I get it. Right. And so there's like, yeah, it's, a, but it's, it's how good, it, you know, it's very hard to recruit. It's not, you just go and just hire people because they're cheap. Like you have to no. really still put in the good processes, identify the talent. Yeah. They don't have the same culture of entrepreneurship and aggressive, like not every job can be done there. And they, you know, yeah. you have to work really hard to find the right talent but they're definitely out thoughtful. there yeah yeah, yeah. And, and putting in the good processes to identify that talent so um yeah it's a bit of both we're doing that as well like we have quite a lot of people offshore we've got 600 people in asia another five or six hundred contractors mm. uh, in asia and in latin america yeah um, latin america so, coming on strong as well some great universities in south america latin america and yeah just incredible developers coming out of some schools there and people are starting to pull them together and then I saw one company, I won't say which it is, but they're basically taking pools of business process people, skimming the top 2% of them, then putting them through training and then having them do business functions. So it's kind of like you were saying, like there's some diamonds in the rough there. And then if you put them through US based training for, let's call it, you know, management type processes, they're going to get better and better. Uh, well, well, I think that's, all, that's one of the opportunities that's out there is like, you know, people have done offshoring for like 20 years, like we're not talking about anything new. No, but they tended to just like send out like almost like a body shop of people just like do data entry and treat it like almost like a mechanical Turk like, hey, I don't talk to these yeah. people. I just give them work and it gets done. And right. I think there's a big opportunity to go, hey, let's actually onboard them through the Zoom calls, to Slack, yes, to have them on Zoom, have tools, them on Slack, process, like put them in a sauna, like equal, yeah, do a notion, yeah, have yeah, them yeah. on Coda, have them doing but, project management and teach them those next generation skills. What's yeah, the difference? Smart the, people are smart people. Work, I, I haven't seen someone really nail this because it's a different level of like rigor. You know, maybe it's um, kind of interesting. What's the, um, what's the GitLab? It's been like yeah. this fully remote company. I haven't checked in with how they're with what they do, but it's interesting mm. how the fully all remote companies also don't just gravitate towards like, well, don't you just immediately yeah. go towards the lowest cost yeah. labor function? But they don't necessarily. I think they still have tons no. of people in the US. And so it's an interesting point. Like it's not just the cheapest labor. You've got to get the the team skill and the culture and all these other things together. But yeah. over the next 20 years, you're gonna see that. You know, even the rise that we were talking about, tying it back together to the e-com companies. Like I lived in China, uh, so 18, 19 years ago, uh, for a couple of years. And I was always predicting back then that, Hey, once these Chinese companies figure out how to do branding, they're going to take mm. over the world yes. because they make, the, they make the product. And then I slap my brand on the thing and mark it up five X and I get all the if margin. They can learn UX, UI design. I always said this about Israeli and they're companies. They're starting to do it. You know, that's they're what these companies are. Yes. That's would, what's happening right now. I always said this about Israeli companies. I would meet an Israeli company like this company's got the most amazing technology. And then they would tell me the name of it. And the domain name would have a dash in it and be a dot org. And I'm like, yeah, who yeah, did yeah, the branding yeah. on there? So like, who cares about branding? I'm like, consumers. 
Yeah. Corporate people, everybody cares about branding. Apple, Microsoft, you right. ever see the logos and the design of these websites? Like they, branding's a thing. So yeah, 20 years ago, I sort of predicted that's going to happen. And what, what I thought would have to happen, and this is what happened, is that generation would have to grow up who really speaks English and has a more global mindset mm -hmm. to become the leaders of the companies. Yes. Because 20 years ago, when I was living in China, they had people who spoke English on the team, like doing sales or customer, mm -hmm. you know, relationships. They weren't That's the what CEOs. I would talk to. Yeah. They weren't the CEO and they're not yeah. going to, their English was not good enough. Right. To like do the marketing and do no. the branding and the brochures, but they weren't going to tell the boss, my English is not good enough because he'll fire them. Yeah. So their branding was terrible. Right. <laughs> but then once that guy becomes the CEO, he can go, Hey, my English is not good enough. I know because I, I speak English, somebody. but not good enough. Let me go get the pros. Let me build this it was up. The brilliant thing about it. Singapore. They had this like incredible leader. I've been watching his videos on YouTube. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Yeah. Lee Kuan Yew. And um, at some point he was just like, English is the language in Singapore. That's it. We're done. We we want to be, you know, we, we want to be the leaders in Asia. Uh, and Singapore just made this decision to have English as their language. I understand it. And um, once they made that jump and people got over it, they, they really became uh, super powerful. And yeah, you're definitely seeing, uh, you know, increased design. And when I was in the Middle East, there's been a whole generation there now who are our age, you know, 40s, 50s, who went to Western schools based upon scholarship. So UAE, Qatar, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, all these countries had Kuwait, these scholarship programs for the nationals to go to any school in the West, it could be Oxford, could be Michigan, could be Harvard, whatever they could get into, plus get a stipend and get paid to go and have their housing paid for. And um, when I've been spending time in the Middle East, I'm meeting folks and like, oh yeah, no, no, I went to you know, this school, I went to Fordham, I went to, you know, the school in Michigan, I went to, you know, a school in Hawaii, whatever it is, Arizona, it's not all just Ivy League. And they've just got a whole generation there who now have gone back and are running businesses, venture firms, LPs, private businesses, and they're just incredibly, they're, they're more worldly, obviously, than Americans. Uh, yeah. Because they've, they've been educated for a decade and lived in the West and then gone back to their countries. And that's why you're seeing them modernize so quickly over there. It's because those people are like, yeah, I, I want to have what I had when I lived in America or when I lived in London. We need that here in our country. And then they build those businesses in Riyadh or Doha or Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You know, it's it's one of the interesting things about Flexport and how we work is that we'll actually onboard local, we call them local heroes, but this like, for example, I was talking about the one in Vietnam. It's the largest logistics company in Vietnam, but they're only in Vietnam. They mm -hmm. were great. CEO speaks English really well. He's very global experienced, uh, but they have local capabilities, local assets. So we onboard them to our technology. Uh, we get therefore the best service locally at a low cost because they're good at hiring locals and managing that. They're good at local relationships that are needed. And then we give them the tech, the global brand. Mm. This guy wouldn't, you know, they don't have the sales force all over the world to go sell to Western brands and bring it. So that's a big part of how Flexport works is actually empowering these kind of local companies that do great service in the small in these markets. And we get to meet a lot of these great entrepreneurs. And you're right, a lot of them are educated in the West or spent time and then came back to their home country. Yep. Uh, and actually, a lot of Flexport teams in these countries are like that, too. Mm -hmm. Like our head of Korea lived in Texas for like six years, a Korean guy, but he lived in Texas running sweet or doing sales for yeah. a forwarding company. So he knows back barbecue. In Korea. He knows Korean yeah. barbecue and Texas and barbecue. Texas, yeah, exactly. He can, That's a superpower. That, I mean, right there, two best barbecue you can get. Uh, <laughs> all right, listen, Ryan Peterson, it's great to have you in the program. You're always so honest. Uh, continued success. And if you want to work for a great leader and, and a great company, uh, Flexport, maybe they're hiring, maybe they're not. I don't know. Uh, selectively, what is hiring? You're trying to keep the, be more efficient we're, we're and not always, do it. We always have roles. Um, we're definitely, we're definitely focused big time on profitability and dialing it in and, mm -hmm. um, not in not in the hiring sprees that we've been in the past, but yeah, selectively, there's definitely there's definitely yeah. some interesting jobs, especially in Asia. We're expanding. Mm. Uh, we launched in uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Korea. I'm really interested Taiwan, in that part Singapore. of the world. I've, I've been yeah, to Korea, but I haven't teams. been to Vietnam, Singapore. I haven't been to that region. I was just every now and then. I don't know if you ever do this. Go on Google Maps and just kind of look at that region, and it's just indonesia and singapore and vietnam it's also fascinating to me these island chains and they kind of hook up with australia eventually and you're yeah like, google wow. earth is my favorite uh product in the world if i was not uh not yeah. an entrepreneur i tried to go get a job at google earth man it's such a cool product yeah it's just like and i, I was looking at the um, 
I don't know if you're tracking what's happening in northern Saudi Arabia, Neom, you know, the NEOM yeah, project. And they're building this huge city. And, uh, you know, that's by, I guess, some of these um, pathways and ports and everything. Uh, a lot of ports around that area and, and that part of the, the... Yeah, they're trying uh, to make it a big port. You know, and coming back yeah. again to the Red Sea, it's like... Well, if the Red Sea is cut off from trade, that's not going to work out. So, it, yeah, I do think Saudi's going to want to beautiful step oceans up. and everything, and and scuba diving and gorgeous vistas, and it's just like totally undeveloped. And now they're like, you know what? We're going to build Hong Kong or you know what, whatever you, the, what they're building there, whatever you qu qualified as, and they're moving fast, and they're going to put like five hundred billion dollars into this. It'll sort probably of, work. I mean, yeah. you know, China's got a big track record of doing this. Well, like Hong Kong itself, the Brits did that. Yeah. There was no city there. Shanghai wasn't Macau, a city that was Shanghai, built by the Brits. Shenzhen. Macau. And then Hong Kong, and then China built Shenzhen overnight, built a new city. You free put trade special zone. economic zone, free yeah. trade zones, you set it up, the world will come. So yeah. that'll probably work. And, and it's in a great place. You know, yeah. it's right on the, as long as the, the Red Sea is open for navigation. Yeah, I mean, you can get to Italy, Greece. You know, you're yeah. in a couple of hours on a flight. You can get to India from Saudi in a couple of hours on a flight. I mean, that's one of the really interesting things about Dubai and that whole region. If you're going to Asia, if you're going to Europe, if you're going to Africa, India, it's you're just yeah, it's the center of the world. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the downside. I still, I still am a big believer in building companies in San Francisco. There's something special about the people here. Yeah, uh, but man, we're the edge of the earth. Like we are so yeah. far. getting here is you want to go anywhere. Hard. It's like uh, the Pacific Ocean. It's like spin Google Earth open. And you'll see it. Like half of the Earth is is the Pacific Ocean. It's very far, very hard to get anywhere from San Francisco. So it's, that's great the annoying for part. security. You know, it's pretty hard to do a land attack on America, <laughs> the Atlantic and Pacific. And we've got basically we're complaining about the borders. We've got two borders, folks. It's not really that hard. <laughs> southern border, northern border. Pretty hard to get into the yeah. northern one. A little easy to get into the southern one. I think we just take it for granted, you know, how um, hard it is to get here. You know, it's, you, you can't yeah, just no, take no, a puddle American jumper. geography is just like unstoppable. There's a great um, YouTube video, like from uh, one of my favorite channels called Real Life Lore. Oh. Uh, called Why, Why America's Geography is So On Point. And it is just like, it'll blow your mind about how blessed we are from a geography. Our geography is so good that like we, no matter how hard we screw it up, try to screw it up with politics, we still can't seem to screw it up. So. Yeah, no, I mean, to have two giant oceans on either side of us, and then the middle of the country is empty. Like, you fly over this country, and you're just like, we have 300 million people? We could have 3 it's billion. It's empty, but it's full of well, the farmland, you know. Farmland, it's the greatest farmland in the mountains, world. mountains, trees. Rivers. I mean, it's unbelievable. The, um, the river network is, you know, I was mentioning Vietnam, how they have a big advantage having a river network for doing navigation of freight movements. But the United States has more navigable rivers than all the other countries in the world combined. Yeah. And, and just to really? put that in contrast, yeah. And, and the Mississippi River is just incredible. The network that goes and it connects to the Great Lakes and then all the way up to Canada. Yeah. Um, and you compare that to Mexico, they don't have a single navigable river in the entire country. Wow. Uh, so too we're dry. very blessed. Too close to the equator, yeah. Too mountainous and yeah, too dry, too mountainous. Um, so we're just very blessed geographically. Uh, we got Canada and rivers, melting like, all the water. <laughs> totally, yeah. And it rains a lot over in the East Coast. And, and we don't <laughs> think about that that much because you're like, well, rivers, whatever. But we use, we use it like crazy in logistics. Like all the grain shipping out of the Midwest is going down. We're the biggest food exporter in the world. That's why oil yeah. exports are flowing down these rivers, like tons of ore and products flowing we, we in the rivers. We used to have that really, like if you look at Napa, Yauntville, Petaluma, all of those areas north of San Francisco, they used to bring the butter, the cheese, the milk down, all of these, um, and you can look it up online and they still have it, we, the Napa River and all these inlets. The Petaluma they, River, yeah. Petaluma River, they would just take barges down with milk, cheese, whatever, into San Francisco, then San Francisco to the rest of the country and the world. Uh, but it's, it's what allowed um, the United States to become like industrialized at the East Coast cities could, mm. because normally, you know, if without the river network, you'd have all those great plains, but mm -hmm. how could you get the food there from there to the East Coast? Like you can't, yeah. food can't travel on the back of a horse. The horse no. will eat all the food, you know, it can go about a hundred miles before it, it eats all the food that Not required to that can carry. Not a efficient model. It just won't work if yeah. for grain or whatever. You need ships. Uh, and so the fact that we had that river network flow down out of New Orleans and up around Florida Crazy. and up to the East Coast, like that's what allowed America to develop. And yeah. we're just very blessed on that. And it's not obvious. Like you sit there at home and go, oh, America. It's like, it's not just about culture. A lot of it's geography and it's, it's very underrated. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've heard that geography is destiny. Yeah. A lot of it is destiny. All right. Listen, 
uh second time i'll try to end the show third time it's so great to talk to you ryan <laughs> no it's hard i mean we always get, hit some pivot point and just another idea another idea another idea uh continued success with the company congrats at being back in the uh in the driver's seat and wish you good luck on this very important 2024 for you and the team get profitable get fit and uh, who knows maybe 2025 uh Thanks, we'll man. be trading the stock I appreciate it. Thanks for having me back on the show. You know, yeah. I've been listening to this show since uh, 2008 or something. So I'm wow. glad to see you're still Thank grinding, you. man. It's like, I can't I love believe it. What, me, how many episodes you've done. No, I mean, it's like 1900 of this and 160 of all in. So it's over 2000 now. And I, I just look at it as this would have been like you and I having a drink, right? We just would have sit there and just, oh, let's talk about America. Let's talk about Saudi. Let's talk about Neom. Let's talk about outsourcing. And then I leave this. What people don't understand is I took the Myers-Briggs, uh, which is like, um, astrology for men is what we call it and i was like 94 and 100 percent extroverted on two times i took the test in 20 years which means i get out of this conversation i have all these notes i've written down i feel like my battery's full after talking to entrepreneurs investors people who are building in the world it's the greatest gift in the world that i get paid with the advertising on this program uh to just share stories with the world you know and millions of people watch it and man it feels great and I, and I get awesome, a lot man. out of it. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for having me here. All right. Be cool, brother. I will talk uh, to you soon. Good luck to the team and we'll talk to you soon.